both seats as this is a sold out event. Thank you.
Welcome to Washington Hall. Before we begin, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones, pagers, and other electronic devices. For your safety, please take a moment to locate the nearest exit. You may remain on our exit for one brief moment. Please look at our website. of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. And it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to our event this afternoon. Uh, it's also my pleasure to welcome uh, Dean Sarah Mastillo, the IA O'Shaughnessy Dean of the College of Arts and Letters, and she has a few words of welcome uh, herself. Sarah? Good afternoon. On behalf of the College of Arts and Letters, I'd like to welcome visitors, especially Congresswoman Liz Cheney, to Notre Dame. To Notre Dame students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends, also welcome to this exciting event. Pope Paul VI in the Vatican II document, Dignitatis Humanae, urges everyone, especially educators, to quote, do their utmost to form men and women who on the one hand will respect the moral order and be obedient to lawful authority, and on the other hand, will be lovers of true freedom. Men and women, in other words, who will come to decisions in their own judgment and in light of the truth, govern their activities with a sense of responsibility, and strive after what is true and right, willing always to join with others in cooperative effort. The University of Notre Dame strives to form young men and women with good judgment, future leaders of our country who will act with a sense of responsibility for the common good, and citizens with the courage to pursue the truth. Among the way we do this at Notre Dame is by introducing our nation's next generation of leaders to our country's current leaders. When Professor Munoz launched the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government, he had in mind events exactly like today's. Earlier today, Congresswoman Cheney had lunch with the center's undergraduate student fellows. I was not able to join them, but I'm sure whether the students agree or disagree with Representative Cheney's politics, they profited immensely from the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with a stateswoman with the courage to pursue the truth. Pope Benedict wrote in the encyclical Deus Caritas Est, or God is Love, the just ordering of society and the state is a central responsibility of politics, and Catholics cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. I am grateful for the opportunities our faculty, students, and other community members have through the Center for, the, for Citizenship and Constitutional Government to be a part of the fight for justice, and I'm especially grateful to Congresswoman Cheney for her public service to our nation and for her visit to Our Ladies University. Again, welcome to you all, and welcome to Congresswoman Cheney. Thank you, Sarah. I know uh, today is an especially busy day for you, so thank you for joining us. Uh, as Dean Mastello mentioned, we launched the center two years, or a year ago. Um, our mission is to cultivate uh, thoughtful and educated citizens uh, to support scholarship and education concerning the ideas and institutions of constitutional government. I mean, never uh, has that mission been more important to our country than right now. Uh, we explore fundamental principles, uh, the principles and practices of a free society. Our aim is to equip our next generation of leaders to secure our God-given natural rights, to exercise the responsibilities and leadership in self-government, and of course, to pursue the common good. Uh, we do this in a number of ways. Uh, the center directs the Constitutional Studies minor, uh, one of the largest minors in the College of Arts and Letters. Uh, we have a fellowship program, as uh, Dean Mastillo just mentioned, for our undergraduate students. We have about two dozen fellows. Among the things they do is uh, meet with our uh, visiting guests. So we, we just had lunch with Congresswoman Cheney in a wonderful 90-minute um, seminar with her. Um, and then we host events like, uh, like today's. Um, 
Our lecture series, I think, is one of the most interesting, uh, certainly most controversial on campus. Um, and if uh, you would like to know more about what we're doing, uh, I encourage all of you to visit our website, uh, nd Dot con, con studies dot edu. For those students interested in the minor or the fellowship program, please come talk to me after um, our event today. I should mention, um, since I have your attention, our next big event uh, is uh, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina will be here on Friday, November 4th for a public event. So come back and join us then. That's, I guess, three weeks from today, so Friday, November 4th. Uh, a few thank yous, if you don't mind. Um, today's lecture is sponsored by the Rudin Center for the uh, Study of American Democracy. I'm very thankful to its director, Matt Hall, and uh, the board of the Rudin Center for co-sponsoring today's event. Uh, they're great partners for us. And uh, for anyone who's run anything, you know that events like this are a lot of work. I have a tremendous staff, and I just want to take a moment to recognize them, uh, Jen and Soren and, and Mary Frances and Debbie. Um, they do all the work, and I just I want you to know how deeply thankful uh, I am to them. Um, as I said, the, the center aims to bring the most thoughtful and the most consequential political leaders to campus. Uh, our students learn the practice of citizenship from, from our leading citizens. Uh, whether you agree or, or not with Congresswoman Cheney on matters of policy or prudence, I think we can all recognize her bold and uncompromising stand for character and its importance in our political life. Um, so I'm thrilled that she's here, and I'm also thrilled uh, to uh, uh, reinvoke our tradition of having one of our students introduce our speakers. So I'm going to call to the podium Henry True. Uh, Henry's a sophomore. Um, mechanical engineering uh, major uh, from Keough Hall and not uncoincidentally from, from Wyoming. So Henry. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, my Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Congresswoman Liz Cheney serves as Wyoming's lone member of Congress in the U.S. House of Representatives. She was first elected in 2016 on a platform of restoring American strength and power in the world and pursuing conservative solutions to create jobs, cut taxes and regulation, and expand America's energy, mining, and agricultural industries. From 2019 to 2021, Cheney served as the chair of the House Republican Conference, the third ranking Republican in the House of Representatives. She sits on the House Armed Services Committee and also serves as the Vice Chair for the January 6th Committee. Previously, Congressman Cheney served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs and Coordinator for Broader Middle East and North Africa Initiatives. A specialist in national security and foreign policy, she was also a Fox News analyst and is the co-author, along with her father, former Vice President Dick Cheney, of the book Exceptional, Why the World Needs a More Powerful America. Her service in the House of Representatives will come to an end in January 2023. As a Wyoming citizen, I am proud to be represented by Congresswoman Cheney, a leader in defense of democracy. We're delighted that she has joined us today to deliver her lecture, Saving Democracy by Revering the Constitution. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, um, and, and thank you to Henry. What a great uh, introduction. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Henry's family and my family go back um, a number of generations, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to see the next generation of trues and, um, and to see you, you here at Notre Dame and to know the success that you're going to have. Uh, so thank you very much. Appreciate that. And thank you to the dean and uh, also to Professor Munoz uh, and, and to all of you. Thank you for having me 
here today. It's, it's a special uh, privilege to be able to be here um, at the, the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government, uh, and, and a tremendous honor to have the chance to talk about, um, to talk about both of those things, to talk about uh, what it means to live in a republic, um, and to talk about the, the responsibilities that we all have. Um, I, uh, before I was elected to Congress, and actually beginning many years ago, I had the opportunity to work around the world uh, in a number of countries uh, that, that don't know freedom, countries that are not characterized by democratic forms of government. And the way that I think about the challenges facing our country today uh, is informed at least partly by those experiences and by the individuals that I had the chance to meet and to work with and by seeing and understanding the lengths to which people will go, the sacrifices that people will make uh, for freedom and for the right to vote. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, 30 years ago now almost uh, to be an election observer in northern Kenya and we were observing parliamentary elections. We were a bipartisan team and we were uh, sent to monitor elections at a schoolhouse and as we arrived uh, people were lined up to vote and it was our responsibility to monitor to make sure that the voting was fair and, and secure. And after we'd been there for a little while, troops showed up, soldiers armed, and they chased the people away from the polling place. And we all sort of looked at each other, those of us on the observation team, and we said, you know what, we aren't going to have very much to report today because obviously people aren't going to be voting here. And then within an hour of these people being chased from the polling place uh, by armed men, they started to come back. They started to walk back in um, to cast their vote. And we were, we were stunned and so impressed that they, they were willing to risk their lives for the right to vote. And it's an image that I've never forgotten. Uh, I also had the opportunity to work in Russia in 1992 and 1993. And I worked with a young mayor whose town was working on privatizing their businesses. This was uh, after the Soviet Union had disintegrated. And we were looking as the US government for somebody we could provide support and help to at a local level, somebody who was committed to free enterprise, committed to helping to reform his town. Uh, and, and so I worked with this young mayor uh, and listened to him talk about his dreams of freedom for his people and watched over the course of, of the next couple of decades as he became more and more prominent in Russia and watched with great heartbreak uh, when he was assassinated by Putin's thugs just a few years ago. His name was Boris Nemtsov. And he was assassinated because of his dedication to freedom. Uh, I also, when I was, I worked in Poland, and I was there after the wall came down, um, and studied the story of, of Pope John Paul II, and what he did, and what he meant, and the, the power of his message of Christianity uh, in helping to break the chains of communism and of the communist hold on Poland. Uh, I happened also to be in Nairobi when, when he visited Nairobi and listened to him speak there. And then I was with my dad when he was vice president and we had an audience with the Pope. And, and I will never forget as we were leaving, uh, he grabbed my dad's hand and he looked at my dad and he said, God bless America. And I, I think of that often, and I think we all can agree that God certainly has blessed America. But I also remember uh, something that the minister said to us uh, the weekend after 9-11, when my family and I were gathered at Camp David. We'd been um, taken 
to an undisclosed location. It was Camp David um, in the aftermath of the attacks. And we were at the chapel that Sunday morning. And the minister um, said to all of us who were gathered, as we were thinking about the challenge we faced, that we needed to pray as though everything depended upon God, because it does. And we needed to work as though everything depended upon us, because it does. And that lesson and that message and that guidance is something that is fitting for all times and certainly for the time that we're living in today. Uh, I wanted to, to start today by um, taking you back to the night of January 6th. And on the night of January 6th, uh, the House uh, returned. Uh, we were able to come out of where we had been evacuated to, return back to the floor of the House um, at around 9 o'clock that night. And uh, when we returned to the House chamber, the windows and the doors were broken. The glass was shattered. Um, they had come in and cleaned the chamber up, but there were still furniture that, that had been used as a barricade uh, when the mob was attacking. Um, and there were gas masks, the plastic uh, hoods that we had all uh, put on, and they were uh, spread around the chamber. Um, but before we went into session, I wanted to go and see what the condition was of Statuary Hall uh, and of the rotunda. And so I walked off of the House floor, and I walked first into Statuary Hall. Now, Statuary Hall is the place where the House of Representatives met from 1807 until 1857. So it was the first, the first place where the House met when the Capitol was built. And it's a very historic place, obviously. There are brass plaques on the floor of Statuary Hall that tell you where the desks are of presidents who served in the House when the House met there. So there's a brass plaque that shows you where Abraham Lincoln's desk was, uh, one that shows you where John Quincy Adams sat. And of course, it's the hall where there are the statues of great Americans uh, encircling the walls. As I walked in that evening, um, sitting against every statue and around all of the walls were um, men and women in SWAT gear, in tactical gear, who had just fought for hours for our democracy, for our capital, for the lives of those of us who were there. There were water bottles spread across the floor, water they were drinking, water they'd been using to wash away the tear gas, the other irritants. Uh, and I, I walked around and I tried to say thank you. I tried to thank them. And of course, my words uh, felt inadequate. And I then walked out of Statuary Hall uh, towards the rotunda. And as you leave Statuary Hall, um, if you look up over the door, that's where the oldest statue in the US Capitol stands. And it's a statue of Cleo. She's the muse of history. And she was placed there. Um, she, she rides in a winged chariot of time. And she has a book in her hand. And in her book, she's recording. And, and she's meant to remind, she was put there to remind the members of the house in those days uh, that, that all of our deeds are recorded in the book of history. She's there to remind all of us uh, that what we do um, is part of the fabric of the nation's history. Uh, I left the Statuary Hall and I walked into the rotunda. And I know all of you have seen the rotunda. Many of you, I'm sure, have been there. It's where every president, including President Lincoln and President Kennedy, uh, have lain in state. It's where the statues of men uh, like Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln and Grant and Eisenhower, Ford, Reagan, they encircle the halls. And, and again, um, against every wall were brave men and women who had been fighting the battle for our capital that day. In the rotunda, there's also uh, a series of, of paintings 
that encircle the walls. They're paintings that were uh, done by George Trumbull. And one of those paintings in particular, um, they, they all depict early American history. But one of them depicts the moment in 1793 when George Washington resigned his commission when he handed control of the Continental Army back to Congress. And Trumbull, who painted this, said he thought, quote, this was one of the highest moral lessons ever given to the world, this voluntary handing back of power. And it, it began the peaceful transfer of power in this nation. And if you go back and you look at the inaugural addresses of so many of our presidents, you'll see they talk about this peaceful transfer of power. Reagan said it was, quote, nothing short of a miracle. Kennedy said it was a celebration of freedom. And it is something that binds us together as Americans. It is a miracle, that peaceful transfer of power that has been honored by every American president until Donald Trump, everyone. In the, the days after January 6th, um, my husband and I were having dinner with our two youngest children. And uh, I, I looked across the table at my sons. And I had a sudden realization that all of us, all of us, have grown up in this country um, and have been able to count on the fact that we would have a peaceful transfer of power. That even if you disagreed with the outcome of an election, even if you fought that election hard and you understood that you know, your candidate had lost, that we could count on the people leading us to guarantee a peaceful transfer of power. And I looked at my sons and I thought to myself, are they going to be the generation that no longer can count on that? And I. I determined then, I'm determined now, as long as I can, in every way possible, I'm going to fight to make sure that that is not the case, that every single generation in this nation. Uh, that, that, that all of us um, no, we can guarantee the peaceful transfer of power and count on the peaceful transfer of power. And I, I do think uh, that, that this is a question that all of us, not just those of us who are in elected office, but all of us have to ask ourselves. Uh, in this time of testing for this country, in this time of challenge, uh, are we going to do our duty? What will future generations say about us? when they look at this moment and they say, when the chips were down, did they do their duty? And the fundamental question for us is, will we commit ourselves to our Constitution? And will we commit ourselves to honor the outcome of our elections even when we lose? And maybe especially when we lose. That is the fundamental fabric of our democracy. And, and that is what is at risk today. Today, there are too many people, too many Republicans in elected office who are ignoring the threat. And this isn't about policy. I voted with Donald Trump over 90% of the time, I think 93% of the time. I'm a conservative. I've always been a conservative. But we don't get to have the battles about policy if we don't build those structures if we're not built on a foundation of truth. And the truth really matters. One of the most interesting exchanges that Professor Munoz was talking about at the lunch we just had with the students uh, was, what do you do about disinformation? What do we as a society do about truth? And one of the most important things that we all have to do is commit individually ourselves to educate ourselves, to know what information we're consuming, and to face the truth and to face facts. And there are some crucially important facts that I want to talk about today. And that is the threat posed by Donald Trump. 
It is an ongoing and real threat. If you haven't watched the January 6th hearings, I urge you to please download them and watch them. If you think that they were partisan, I urge you to realize that nearly every witness who testified in front of our committee was a Republican. And not just any Republicans, but Republicans who were appointed to the highest offices in the land by Donald Trump, his attorney general, more, more than one, uh, his White House counsel, the head of his campaigns, uh, his family. These are people who talked to this committee about what happened, about what they knew, and more importantly, about what he knew. And what we need to recognize and understand is that President Trump had a premeditated plan, a premeditated plan to declare victory, no matter the outcome of the election, no matter the results, a premeditated plan to do so. And on election night, his advisors told him not to. They said, we don't have the results. We don't know the outcome. Don't declare victory tonight. With the exception of, of Rudy Giuliani, they said, don't do it. And even Rudy Giuliani admitted later they didn't have the evidence. They did not have evidence of fraud. They didn't have evidence uh, of irregularities sufficient to change the outcome of the election. But Donald Trump determined he was going to declare victory and then set about trying to find the evidence, trying to find people who would fabricate the evidence. And when you look back now, and I do, people say to me, well, you know, the election, that they, they think it was stolen. People will say, well, maybe there was fraud. And another key point to remember is that on election day and in the days after the election, there was no American, no American who was better informed about the absence of fraud than Donald Trump. And just think about that. He had access to information because his Justice Department was investigating the allegations of fraud, because his campaign was telling him, listen, if you combine all of the allegations of fraud and all of the allegations of irregularities, if you combine them all together and you interpret them in the way most favorable to Donald Trump, it's not enough to change the outcome of the election. He knew, and he knew more than any other American potentially had the, had the opportunity or the ability to know. But in spite of this, he made the conscious decision to claim fraudulently that the election was stolen. He made the decision to pressure state officials to change results. He made the decision to manufacture, to work, to pressure state officials and Republican Party officials in a number of states to manufacture fake electoral slates, to attempt to corrupt the Department of Justice, and to summon tens of thousands of people to Washington, D.C. And then when they got to Washington, D.C., on the morning of January 6th, he knew they were angry, and he knew they were armed. And he sent them to march to the Capitol. And then at 2.24, knowing full well that there was a violent attack underway on the Capitol, he sent out a tweet saying that Vice President Pence didn't have the courage to do what was right. And if you look at the timeline, you will see that tweet went out at 2.24. He knew there was violence. He knew the tweet would incite further violence. And indeed, about five minutes later, there was a line of Metropolitan Police officers on the west front of the Capitol. And that line broke because thousands surged forward. It's the first time in history a Metropolitan Police Department line like that has broken. Now, Thanks to the bravery of Metropolitan Police Officers and Capitol Police Officers, they held the door. And, and I want you also to think about, when I say the door, to understand what door I'm talking about. The door that they held, the door that you see in the videos where you see police officers being brutally beaten, where you see thousands in the crowd surging forward, that is the door that the presidents of the United States walk out of when they are going to be sworn into office. 
It is the door that leads to the inaugural platform. And the battle that was fought over that door was medieval, was hand-to-hand -hand combat. I talked to one police officer that night who told me he'd served in Iraq, and he had never seen anything like the combat that he saw that day. And if they hadn't held that door, we would have had thousands more people inside the Capitol and an even worse constitutional crisis. And while that was all going on, Donald Trump was in the dining room off the Oval Office watching it on television. And his family members were coming in and pleading with him to tell the people to stop and go home. His staff was coming in and pleading with him. Members of Congress were calling with him, pleading with him to stop the violence and tell people to go home. And I ask you to think about this not in any kind of a political way. This isn't about politics. Donald Trump was the one person who could tell the mob to stop. He was the one person who could get people to go home and he watched for hours and refused to do so. And I want you to think about what kind of a human being does that. That is not normal or acceptable or lawful in our republic. But what gives me hope has been the individuals that we have seen, both those who've testified in front of the committee uh, and those who haven't, but those who acted that day to save the republic. And that, that is one of the most important stories of what happened on January 6th. The power and the courage and the dazzling honor of individual Americans who saved this republic. And they are mostly Republicans. They are people like Rusty Bowers in Arizona, who was the recipient of unbelievably intense pressure from Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani and others to change the outcome in Arizona. Rusty Bowers was, was facing this pressure while his daughter was dying. And if you think about the strength of that man and you think about what he did and you think about his commitment to the Constitution, that, that is an awesome thing that should give us all tremendous hope. If you think about people like Brad Raffensperger, if you think about people who've testified in front of our committee like Sarah Matthews, Cassidy Hutchinson, these people who have stood up for the truth and who understand and recognize that in this nation, our institutions do not sustain themselves. They only sustain themselves because individuals do the right thing. And every citizen of this country, and I, whether you are elected or not, has an obligation to make sure that you are doing everything you can to defend the institutions of our republic and to recognize what it means to be a nation of laws, not a nation of men. We can all disagree with, with the rulings of, of the courts, but none of us can ignore the rulings of the courts. And Donald Trump did that. 61 out of 62 courts who heard his claims, who heard the claims of his allies, who saw the evidence, ruled against him. And the President of the United States has a duty to ensure that the laws are faithfully executed. A President of the United States cannot ignore the rulings of the courts. No citizen can do that. And we need to recognize and understand what it means when we say that we're a nation of laws. When we say that we're a nation of laws, that means that no matter the outcome, no matter our disagreements with the courts, we abide by and we respect them. We also all have an obligation to ensure that we're conducting ourselves in a way that's worthy of this republic and that's worthy of the men and women in uniform who have died and who have fought and who have sacrificed so much for us in every single generation. Uh, I will never forget in the uh, weeks after January 6th receiving an email from a Gold Star father. And he said to me, standing up for truth honors all who gave all. 
Our duty and our responsibility as Americans means that we have to conduct ourselves uh, in ways that will perpetuate the Republic and that are worthy of those who've come before and mostly of those who wear the uniform of this nation. And at this moment in our history, that means we have to pull back from the abyss. We have to pull back from the toxicity, from the, the vitriol, um, from the, the political battles that are being waged, separate from substance, separate from policy, um, that threaten to tear this nation apart, and that have introduced violence again into our political life. As Americans, we must be able across party lines to stand up and say violence has no part in the political disagreements of this nation. It must never. As, as the select committee has been working, um, we have also seen federal judges across the country, federal judges in Washington uh, in particular, um, addressing January 6th cases. And as you all know, our judges are sworn to do impartial justice, to preserve the Constitution and to preserve the Union. And, and I want to read just a few things to you from one judge's statements uh, at a recent sentencing hearing. This was a sentencing hearing for the individual who brutally attacked uh, Officer Fanon on January 6th. Here's what she said, quote, high-ranking members of Congress and state officials who know perfectly well that the claim of fraud was and is untrue and that the election was legitimate are so afraid of losing their own power that they won't say so. She went on to say it has to be crystal clear that it is not patriotism, it's not standing up for America to stand up for one man who knows full well that he lost instead of standing up for the Constitution that he was trying to subvert. What happened on January 6th, she said, and the effort to keep that spirit alive a year and a half later is the utter antithesis of what America stands for. It is the pure embodiment of tyranny and authoritarianism. Now, what happened on January 6th is unjustifiable. And we have to make sure that our nation does not only punish the foot soldiers who stormed our capital. Those who planned to overturn our election, those who brought us to the point of violence, they must also be held accountable. If we don't do that, then the indefensible conduct becomes defensible. If elected officials excuse or ignore what happened, then that inexcusable conduct becomes excusable. And it will happen election after election after election. So I ask you today to consider where our nation is in its history. Consider what it means to be a citizen in our republic and think about what it will take for this nation to survive for another 246 years. Think about the fact that none of us, none of us in a republic can be a bystander. Most especially elected officials cannot be bystanders. Most people in most places in most periods of time on this earth have not been free. America is an exception. And we continue only because we bind ourselves to our founders' principles and to our Constitution. We have to recognize that those principles are above politics, that they are inviolate, and that those principles are more important than any single individual. And let me leave you with this thought. There's a wonderful book written by a man named Ted Widmer and it's called Lincoln on the Verge. And I actually don't know Ted Widmer, but I'm giving his book a plug here. Um, in his book, he, he talks about the power of Lincoln. His book is about Lincoln's train trip from Springfield to Washington, D.C. to be sworn in in 1861. And he, he says Lincoln 
actually believed, he actually believed the promises of our founding documents. And, and Widmer describes it this way. He says, quote, that made him dangerous. It made him dangerous to cynical politicians who just recycled old platitudes without pausing to digest them. So let's leave here today resolved that we all will actually believe the promises of our founding documents, that we'll conduct ourselves so as to uphold them and perpetuate the republic, that we'll fulfill our citizens' duty to defend them, and that we will all remember that there's no power on this earth that is stronger than free citizens determined to stand together to defend the miracle and the blessing of our freedom. Thank you very much. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Congresswoman. Thank you. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. I'm going to start off our uh, question and answer. I have a few questions of my own, and then I'm going to invite, uh, in fact, this, uh, we have a tradition here in the center that our undergraduate students get to ask the first set of questions, and we have a microphone here, and I think a microphone uh, upstairs. Uh, so if students who have questions, I'll invite you to line up, and I'll ask a few questions uh, to start us off. And, uh, let me recognize Dean Cole uh, and his Mrs. Cole. Thank you for joining us. Yes. <laughs> Congresswoman, in your uh, uh, I, and I should mention we I have not talked to, uh, with the Congresswoman about these questions. She has not seen them. Uh, <laughs> in your concession speech in in August, uh, you remarked, uh, "The primary election is over, but now the real work begins." You've told us about that work this afternoon. Can you tell us more about your particular future in doing it? I never get that question. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, what, what I meant um, was uh, that, that there, the, the, the outcome of any primary, um, and certainly the outcome of my primary, uh, isn't the most important thing and isn't, isn't anywhere close to as important as um, the challenges that we're facing as a country. Uh, I think that the challenges that we're facing, um, what it's going to take to right our politics, um, you know, one of my Democratic colleagues said to me recently that he really looks forward to uh, getting back to disagreeing with me. And, um, and I, I like that sentiment a lot because it, it will mean that our politics have righted themselves and that we're debating policy again. Um, and, and so I think that those, the issues and the challenges that we're facing um, from the perspective of the assault on the Constitution um, matter much more than the outcome of any race. I think one of the, one of the ills, one of the dangers that we've seen since January 6th is um, too few elected officials have been willing to, to put uh, the Constitution and fidelity to the Constitution ahead of re-election. Um, but I think we, we have a huge task ahead. I'm uh, very focused right now, obviously, on my final months as Wyoming's representative and on the work on the Select Committee, and um, we'll then make decisions about what's next. But, but I'm I'm not focused on uh, that from a campaign perspective. I know that's how people think about it. Um, I really am focused on it from the perspective of what do we need to do and what can I do um, to help make sure uh, that, that we get back to a place where um, we've clearly defeated the threat 
and we're, um, we're, we're embracing and, and perpetuating the Constitution. Is there uh, one piece of evidence or one moment of testimony uh, during the January 6th committee hearings that you think is most important? I think it's very difficult to pick one. Um, you know, the evidence that, um, that the committee uh, has received, the material that's been produced, the testimonial evidence is, is voluminous. And, um, and we have worked very hard to make sure that we are focusing and highlighting key pieces of that evidence in our hearings. Um, I think what's, what's important for people to recognize is it was a, a multi-part plan um, that was overseen, directed, uh, in which Donald Trump had personal and substantial involvement in every element of it, um, from the premeditation to the determination to, you know, attempt to, to claim victory even though he knew he had not won, to pressure state officials, to pressure the Department of Justice, to pressure the Vice President, to get people to submit fake electors, um, and then of course, as I mentioned, um, to send the mob to the Capitol. And, and I ask people to, to think about this comparison. Um, Sometimes when we talk about what happened on the 6th, we become numb because we've heard about it, we've watched it, we've seen it. I think we must fight against that. It cannot be normal. And so, you know, people should think about, you know, what if uh, Dwight Eisenhower had summoned a mob to Washington, uh, knowing that they were armed, sent them to march on the Supreme Court, during the arguments in Brown v. Board of Education. And then when the attack was underway, refused to stop it. It's unimaginable. We cannot imagine because Dwight Eisenhower was an honorable man. He never would have done that. He understood his duty. And so I, I, think, I think it's really important for people to focus on um, both Donald Trump's actions, but also his inaction that day. Uh, do you think Donald Trump broke the law on or around January 6th? If so, what laws? And if so, should he be criminally prosecuted? Well, the committee um, has the responsibility to make decisions about criminal referrals. And, and I, uh, of course, have my own views about that. I don't want to get ahead of the committee's discussions on it. Um, I would point people to uh, Judge Carter's opinion. Uh, in which he said that it's more likely than not that Donald Trump and John Eastman violated at least two federal criminal statutes. Um, and uh, so I, again, I, I want to, I don't want to get ahead of the committee, but I think, I think you will see uh, the committee's work in this regard um, done in a unanimous way. Um, and, and I think it's, I think there's no question about the answer. Why did the committee wait to the last day of the hearings to subpoena the president? Why not on day one? Well, uh, it's not necessarily the last day of the hearings. Um, but um, I think we have felt it's very important that the investigation be conducted in a way that is uh, rigorous and disciplined and responsible. and. That has meant collecting evidence um, from um, many, if not not all, because of course some people uh, took the fifth or some people refused to appear, but, but collecting evidence from all of those around the central figure in January 6th before we uh, issued a subpoena for him. And so that's, that's what we've done. Okay. Uh, one last question from me. Um, you talked how you're a Republican, you're a conservative. Uh, what would you say to those conservatives who might say something like the following? Uh, yes, I know uh, Trump lacks the character to be president. I don't really like him much. But at least he stood up to the woke mob and the cultural elite. And he defends folks like us who are traditionally religious. At least he fought for us and gave voice to us that establishment Republicans never have and never seem to do. 
I would have a lot to say to those people. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I would say, first of all, th there is there's nothing Christian or faithful I in any religion uh, about someone who sits by and allows violence that he sparked to occur and refuses to take action to stop it, to save people's lives. Um, and secondly, I would say that um, wokeism is a, is a real problem. Cancel culture is a real problem. We, we have to respect and honor the First Amendment, especially on our college campuses. But the response to wokeism cannot be that conservatives torch the Constitution. And we have to be able to maintain our fidelity to the Constitution um, because the Constitution's our shield. And if we abandon it because following it doesn't lead to the outcome that we prefer, then we will not have it as a shield um, when we are faced with threats to our First Amendment rights or our Second Amendment rights or any of the rights that are protected by the Constitution. And we also have to be, um, we have to conduct ourselves in politics in a way that is faithful to and encourages people to put their trust in us um, if you are a conservative and you believe in conservative policies, then you have an obligation to make your case to people and, and to go out and, and conduct yourself in a way that um, explains why we believe in those policies. And, and it cannot be, as we discussed before, that the American people have to choose between wokeism, socialism, and insurrection. That cannot be the choice for the future of the country. And, and we have to be able to present a different and better substantive alternative that's faithful to the Constitution. OK, student, I see we students up here. Um, students, uh, tell us your name and where you are in Notre Dame here. And, uh, uh, thank you, Congressman, for uh, coming to, to Notre Dame for this talk. My name is Nico, um, and I'm a uh, junior here in the, in the Great Books program. Um, my, my general question was about standing up, obviously, like you spoke about, for truth and standing for your beliefs. Um, and I, I was, this is a more specific question regarding um, abortion. Uh, just this is one of the most prevalent issues here on campus, not only um, with recent developments, but also just the the, um, the Catholic character of the university, and the, um, it's, it's an issue that a lot of us are, are talking about, um, especially in the past few weeks. Um, I was wondering if your position um, on abortion and your, your, your pro-life stance has changed over the last uh, few months, maybe since breaking with the party establishment. I'm just uh, genuinely curious about your um, non-voting presence for the Women's Health uh, Protection Act and ensuring access to abortion Act, um, I think in July, which were essentially, you know, unrestricted um, bills offering unrestricted access to abortion. Um, and then obviously with the um, Right to Contraception Act, um, which I think was the same week, um, just genuine, genuinely the consensus seems to be that the language in that bill was broad enough to include, you know, abortion pills and, and some other harmful, um, you know, chemical pills. Um, that are attacking the lives of the unborn. So I'm wondering if your views on the matter have simply changed or um, and how this kind of fits into the, the idea of standing up for truth and standing up for, for your beliefs. Well, thank you very much for the question. And um, my views on the matter have not changed. Uh, I'm pro-life and uh, I'm, I'm proudly and strongly pro-life. Uh, as we talked about in the lunch, um, you know, I, I do believe that there have to be exceptions. And, uh, and I also believe that as politicians debate these issues, um, 
you know, and this is an issue that is one that requires compassion and sensitivity and understanding and respect for what families go through, um, and that we ought to do everything we can to protect the most vulnerable, uh, which are the unborn. Um, but I, I think that too often as this issue is debated, the vitriol and the, the talking points and the attacks that go on don't reflect the reality of people's lives. And um, you know, when, when you're facing a situation, as we've seen in the news recently, where um, you know, a 10-year-old who had been raped um, was not able to obtain an abortion, um, and the debate that went on around that was one that was um, shameful in a lot of ways. Um, I think that we have to be willing to understand and recognize uh, that there have to be exceptions, um, but but that you know when you're when you're dealing with questions about abortion, um, you're talking about two lives, and and that we as a society have to recognize that and make sure that as we're grappling with this issue, um, that we're doing it with a sensitivity and a compassion that reflects um, reflects how painful the issue is. Um, on all sides. Uh, please. Thank you for uh, speaking with us. Um, tell, I was tell, a, tell us your name. And a little your, closer. No, tell us your name. Oh, I'm name. Zane. I'm a freshman here. Um, before I came here, I was uh, an intern for the 3rd Congressional District of Colorado. And one of my jobs was to go to the um, state convention where they were to select people who would be on the Republican nomination ballot for Senate, Governor, uh, and then the 3rd Congressional District. And one of the things that I noticed, um, and it was really disappointing to me, is that in Colorado we had you know, maybe five really good candidates for Senate. And they all did not have a chance to compete on the ballot because uh, one guy was able to get up there. He presented a video of him shooting a Dominion voting machine with a 50 caliber, uh, and it exploded. He got up there and talked about, you know, he was the first to go to Arizona and, you know, protest uh, and cause riot, uh, you know, cause a lot of issues down in Arizona, um, you know, saying that that the election was stolen. And he canceled out a lot of these very highly qualified people uh, from being able to get onto the ballot. They all, it was kind of a circular firing squad. He got 30%. All the others canceled each other out. So he was the one to move forward. Um, but he lost the nomination to John O'Day, who's now running in Colorado. Uh, that was Ron Hanks. But what, what my real question is about is I think the one lesson that we're all going to take away from January 6th is that there are groups in American society that can be easily manipulated by uh, these buzzwords. So moving on in the, you know, the next five, ten years, you know, what are some ways, not just in the Republican Party, but in the Democratic Party, that we can have uh, citizens in the United States start to understand the importance of respecting our elections, starting to take the emotion um, out of all these things and start focusing on the issues that uh, have a, a major impact on, you know, ge uh, American geopolitical strategy and uh, issues here in the homeland? Well, that's a, a good question. There's a lot of parts to that question. I think, um, you know, I would say, first of all, um, your experience at the, the convention, uh, you know, I think about uh, the state of the Republican Party in Wyoming, for example, today. And um, our party in Wyoming is headed by an Oath Keeper. And, um, you know, you, an Oath Keeper who was actually at the Capitol on January 6th and who then came back to Wyoming and suggested that we ought to contemplate secession. Um, so, um, <laughs> So we are in a situation in the country where um, a number of our party structures um, have been taken over by people um, who don't reflect uh, responsible leadership or the types of um, commitment to policy we need. And 
I think we have to take a lesson from their book and we need to get engaged and active at every single level. That means run for you know precinct committee men and women slots. That means run for school board. That means um, recognize and understand that in our country we end up with people that, that um, are not going to do the right thing because at lower levels in the political structure, um, you know, the, the nominating process may have been taken over. I also will say uh, we all have an obligation not to support those people. And so when you end up with, you know, a Republican nominee, uh, as we have in Arizona today, for Secretary of State or for Governor, um, you know, who are saying that they will only respect the outcome of elections if they agree with them, then we have an obligation not to support those people. It doesn't matter what the party, what party they're in. But that also applies to Democrats. The Democrats should not be playing games in Republican primaries and funding election deniers because the... If, if people think that they can't win general elections, um, you know, you're, you're playing with fire. So uh, I think that, that the way to, to solve this is uh, to run for office, to run for office uh, beginning at every level, to be organized, um, and also to think very carefully about how you cast your vote and make sure that you're voting for responsible people. And if, if the Republicans have nominated somebody who uh, expressed who is an election denier or who you can't count on uh, to abide by their oath, then you know you shouldn't vote for that person. You ought to write somebody in or you ought to vote for the Democrat, but you shouldn't vote for the election denier. Congresswoman Cheney, first of all, thank you for the bravery to stand up here. Um, so my name is Joey Yeager. I'm a senior studying philosophy education from Charlotte, North Carolina. And as I was sitting there, I thought, I really like this lady. I think she gets it. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. So my question is about the future of your political career. And <laughs> I was wondering, have you considered running for president? <laughs> I would like to sign you up for my Notre Dame chapter, so we'll <laughs> Now, I mean, this, it's, it's, um, uh, it's the same, same answer that I gave uh, Professor Munoz. Um, I, I think 2024 is gonna be really important. I think that it's gonna be crucial um, that we elect people that, that will defend the Constitution. I haven't made a decision yet about what I'm gonna do. We have a lot of uh, excellent candidates we have a lot of bad candidates too, um, so um, so I'll I'll make decisions about that in the in the coming months. But I appreciate your support. Thank you. Hi, Congressman Cheney. I'm Shri, and I'm a freshman here. Uh, thank Hi. you for so much for being here today. Thank and you. my question is about like a social issue. You initially ran your first campaign on preserving traditional marriage and specifically protections for religious institutions uh, such as Catholic churches that object to same-sex marriage. In light of that, can you explain your vote for the Respect for Marriage Act, which redefined marriage or codified a redefinition of marriage and eliminated those conscience objections? Well, I appreciate the question, and I believe strongly in religious freedom. I'm a strong supporter, uh, have been a strong supporter, will continue to be the Religious Freedom uh, Restoration Act. Um, I also believe that freedom has to mean freedom for everybody. And I don't believe that religious institutions should, should be uh, forced in any way to um, have to participate in uh, activities that violate their religious beliefs. Um, but I, I also believe that, um, as I've said, uh, you know, this is a, it's a personal issue for me. Um, my sister's gay. Um, she's married. And I love her and her family very much. Um, and I, I believe that freedom has to mean freedom for everybody.
Hi, thank you so much for being here. I was sitting in my seat and I was so excited that you were here this weekend at Notre Dame. And I am a senior, my name is Britton Brindle. I'm a poli-sci major and I, um, my father's a veteran. He did multiple tours in Iraq. Um, he was in Jordan within 48 hours of 9-11, which we didn't even know about because he couldn't tell us. Mm. And he's retired now. <laughs> um, but I was just wondering like what Congress is doing for veterans, because a lot of veterans do not feel like Congress is doing enough for them at all. So what are you doing for veterans long term and right now? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for your father's service and your family's service to the country. And uh, support for our veterans um, is, is something that I'm very pleased is a bipartisan issue. Um, and I think that support for our veterans um, takes a whole range of, of different policies. Um, and, and it's interesting if you look at the generational issues, um, in my experience as a member of the Armed Services Committee and of course representing Wyoming, um, you know, there are tremendous veteran services organizations. Um, they tend to reach much more veterans of, of previous generations, veterans of the Vietnam War, for example, tend to be more engaged with veteran services organizations. We need to do more, I think, to help to spread uh, their, their reach and their focus. Um, one of the issues that we've come to recognize is uh, a tragedy and, and unacceptable is the rates of veteran suicide. And dealing with and addressing veterans' mental health is, is crucial. Um, you know, as I would visit uh, our VA hospitals across Wyoming, one of the things that you hear often is veterans know that they need to seek mental health support, but they don't want to go to the VA to do it because they're afraid that it will reflect negatively on their record. And so we've got to find ways that we can do a better job at, at mental health support, at outreach, um, at providing support um, in terms of uh, suicide prevention. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's also uh, crucially important that our VA system, we saw improvements in the VA system during the Trump administration. And um, being, as a veteran, being able to go to the VA system, and if you can't get help and support there immediately, being able to go out into the community and get support from non-VA providers and have that support be covered is also crucial. And so we put in place the CHOICE program, which I think has, has had some mixed results, but has been, been positive for the most part. Um, and I think that um, I, don't, I, I always feel as though, uh, as, a, as a member of Congress, um, you know, one of the things that we have to be able to do, or that we have to do is remember you know, every time that we walk onto the floor of the House, every time that we engage in a political debate on the floor of the House, the only reason we can do that is because of our veterans. The only reason. And, and we, we must never forget that. We have, about, we have about 15 minutes left and uh, many, many students lined up. So we're gonna go as post uh, questions and responses as fast as we can here, uh, please. Uh, thank you for coming to speak, Congresswoman Cheney. Uh, my name is Liam, I'm a freshman. Uh, I think there's a lot of Republicans in the party, maybe not the most vocal uh, you know, segment of the party that really agree with what you're saying, but at the same time say, you know, I really disagree with the path that the country's going under Biden and whatnot, uh, and kind of want to support the Republican party, but are unsure, you know, what does that look like with the influence of Trump and whatnot. So my question is how you think the Republican Party can fight the influence of Trump in the party and make sure that he doesn't get nominated in 2024. You know, it's a really good question. And, and ultimately, parties are just the people who belong to them. And I, I think that we are certainly in a position today where in the Republican Party, um, and I can tell you this from personal experience, um, there is a, you know, a, a tendency to um, censor views that aren't pro-Trump. And 
but I think the only way to combat that is for people to be brave enough to stand up. And look, I have heard, and I understand completely when I hear this, but you know, uh, I hear from people a lot, well, we agree with what you're doing and we really wanna stand up and fight the fight, but we're afraid. And some people will tell me they're afraid for their families, they're afraid for their security. Um, I had members of Congress before the impeachment vote tell me they believed Donald Trump should be impeached, but they couldn't vote that way because they were afraid for the security of their families. And, and I, I just think people have to stop and realize what that means in the United States of America. Um, so it just requires that more people stand up and say no, more people stand up and say this isn't who we are. Um, and, and that we also incentivize the people who do um, and, and show them that there are more of us um, and that we're more determined um, and that we're more dedicated and that we're gonna, we're gonna fight this fight as long as we have to to win. My name is Michael. I'm a senior from Holy Cross College. I noticed there's, to me, there's like a historical parallel between this and the Roman Republic, where people are fearing that it might, we might end up like the Roman Republic because you know fear like poverty and whatnot are attracting people to dangerous men, and you, and if we allow the poverty and other stuff to continue, then it won't, because people will feel enough desperate enough to um, be behind a man who will guarantee everything, even though they my friend the freedoms of it all because they want security, food, and peace at the cost of freedom. How do, how do we counter like the poverty and you know, try to persuade people that we would not turn, make them not t turn to a um, to, um, um, dictator who want to be dictators or um, judicial men who want to seize power? Yeah, that's a really important point and I think that um, I think that, that it requires um, a willingness to understand and recognize the, the choice that people are suggesting be made. Um, I think, you know, there were and are many good people who have believed Donald Trump's lies and continue to believe them. And I think that we have a responsibility to, to do everything we can to make sure people understand what a betrayal he's he's engaged in um and also though to put forward the policies that actually are going to address those concerns and those challenges and make sure that people know that that he's not he's not an acceptable choice that that giving up fundamentally the commitment to a peaceful transfer of power um, is not a trade-off that any of us can make if we want the republic to survive so it's it is I don't want to minimize the difficulty and the challenge or the, the threat, um, but, but I think that it really does require conveying to people what happens if you make that choice. And, and you only, you know, that's a choice you make once and then you can never go back. You never have another fair election free of violence again. Thank you, Congresswoman. My name is Alex Young. I'm a freshman, and I want to thank you, first of all, for your bravery. Um, you. America appreciates it. Thank you. thank you. Many Americans, many Americans across the country have friends and family that are now denying elections. They're denying facts. They're denying objective news stories. You've dealt with this with your colleagues. How do we go about navigating these conversations at the kitchen table? <laughs> You know, it, it's um, it's true. It is it is uh, very divisive and difficult. Um, you know, I I hope that it, one of the things that the committee has been able to do is by showing that that these um, the claims of fraud uh, were rejected again and again by Republicans. I think that's so important, and um, by making sure that people understand and recognize um, you know, that, that, that this is a lie. Um, in some ways, I think it probably is more difficult if you're dealing with family members. There are other emotions that, that 
uh, are involved there, but, but I have certainly um, seen friendships torn apart, uh, seen families torn apart, and, um, and I think, you know, there's no easy answer to it except a commitment to the truth, um, a commitment to respectful dialogue, um, but also understanding that, um, you know, we all have to have these arguments based on facts and evidence, and, and we've had witnesses in front of the committee say things to us like, well, I just, I just, I just feel like it was stolen. I just feel like it. And I, I think one really important point to make to people is you don't get to overturn elections because you feel like they were stolen. And, and so, you know, put yourself in, in the position of, um, if it had been somebody in the other party who was saying, well, I don't have the evidence, I can't produce any evidence in court, every time I've made an allegation, it's been refuted, but I'm just telling you, you should believe it was stolen. Um, we, we would never stand for that if it was somebody in the other party. Um, and, and I think doing a better job at educating people about the rule of law and about why we have to abide by the rulings of the courts um, is, is a key part of it. Hi, my name's Emily, I'm a senior. My question is similar, but specifically in light of how the January 6th committee has been painted as a very polarizing um, event, what else do you think can be done to encourage people who have bought into election fraud claims to kind of change their mind? Yeah, yeah I, um, when, I, when I think about the January 6th committee and the attacks on our committee, um, I think it's, it's important for people to understand how we got to the committee. Um, we all would have preferred a bipartisan outside commission, and that was what we voted for, uh, 35 of us Republicans in the House. Kevin McCarthy withdrew his support for that commission. Um, and then when the idea of this bipartisan commission went over to the Senate, Mitch McConnell fought against it. And, um, you know, what I would say to all of my Republican colleagues is it's never too late to decide you're going to act in a way that's moral. Never too late. And, and I think that um, those of us who are elected, uh, we have an obligation to make sure that we're helping people recognize and understand the truth and not just sort of try to bury our head in the sand and hope for the best. Um, but if people tell you that the January 6th committee, you know, has somehow been partisan, remind them the vast majority of our witnesses have been Republicans. Um, remind them that we've operated uh, in a, a nonpartisan way. You know, our staff has been led by a U.S. attorney appointed by Barack Obama and a U.S. attorney appointed by George Bush. Um, and that uh, every American can watch, watch the facts, can download the hearings, and can see what happened. And um, the people who are attacking it as partisan, uh, I think you also have to ask yourself, why don't they want this investigated? We're going we're gonna to take one more question from down here, and then one more question from, from up above, and then I have a final question. I'm sorry about that, but just... Thank you, Congresswoman. I'm Will Connolly. I'm a sophomore from Pennsylvania. I'm a business analytics major. I just wanted to thank you both for being here and for your work in 2020 and 2021. I was a poll worker in Pennsylvania in 2020, and as my state's election results were very much in doubt, I wanted to thank you and a bunch of the other Republicans who were in our corner. That was very nice of you all. <laughs> but I just wanted to ask, as sort of as someone who's not necessarily conservative or Republican or inclined to vote for Republicans, how can we help the party get back on track <laughs> um, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I, the, you know, my serious answer is uh, vote for serious people. And there are certainly Democrats who aren't serious. Um, you know, we also obviously have Republicans who aren't serious. But I think, you know, on both sides of the aisle, if you, if, when you go in to vote, if you think about it in terms of, you know, would I hire this person? Would I trust this person to babysit my kids? 
um, you know, some <laughs> fundamental questions um, about competence. And, and as a country, getting back to demanding excellence from our elected officials in the same way that we demand excellence in other aspects of our lives. Um, but, but I would say vote for the serious person on both sides. Um, and I also, I think that uh, we need to get away from uh, the sort of polarized policy battles. There's a lot that we can agree on, and there are a lot of people of good faith who we can disagree with, but we can say, all right, let's move together on these issues. We know we're never going to agree on these, but, but let's treat each other with respect. And, and I think that's you know, something that we all can do regardless of party. Hi, Ms. Cheney. I'm Zachary Levy, uh, majoring in journalism and political science. Uh, I just wanted to say, when you look at national polling, you see that issues like the border, COVID even COVID-19, ec the economy, inflation, a lot of those things take precedent over January 6th. So my question is, do you think it's in the best interest of the GOP politically to put as much effort towards January 6th as you have, and if so, why? I don't think that any elected official should ever look at it through that lens. And, um, and it's, a, it's an important question, and it's certainly one that I hear, but, but we cannot make decisions about January 6th based upon what the political result or impact is going to be. Um, you know, that's what we have, that's, that's why we didn't have a bipartisan commission. That's what we've watched happen in the Senate, primarily. And that, you know, we, it, it can't be a political question. Um, I think for the sake of the future, we have to make sure as many people as possible recognize what happened and why it's so dangerous. Um, but I, I don't think that you can look at it and say, well, it wouldn't, it's actually sort of fundamentally anti-constitutional. You know, if you look at our oath and if you look at what the framers said about factions and, and um, about the potential that you would have people who weren't of good faith uh, take power, um, I think we're obligated not to look at it through that lens. And, and I... I also fundamentally believe that at the end of the day, the American people want leaders they can trust. And that, that you have to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to do the right thing. And it may be not the thing that benefits me politically or benefits my party politically, but, but a party that's enthralled to a cult of personality is not just bad for the party, it's bad for the country. And so we have to deal with this outside of politics. Thank you. Okay, one, one last question. This is for my son. I forgot to ask it earlier. This, <laughs> he's 10. Um, we have a big game tomorrow. What's the, fin what's the final score tomorrow? 34-14. Yeah. On, uh, on behalf of the University of Notre Dame and the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government, uh, thank you for visiting us, thank you for your time, and thank you for, for your service. Thank you. Thank you very much.